Greetings, Hope students. Uh, good to see you. Another week in quarantine, but as we move towards summer, uh, things are starting to show a little bit of change, and we're starting to have some hope for future gatherings, and I'm looking forward to that. Just a couple of things of note. I've said before, Michael Knight's coming back as their summer intern. I'm talking to him, thinking about what lessons are going to look like this summer, uh, doing all sorts of fun things. But as we work through the book of Matthew, uh, we're going to start speeding up a little bit and even skip a few things um, as we try to complete it. Uh, in time for summer so that we can do that. Also, June 7th will be the first Sunday of summer where we officially kind of move up those sixth graders. I talked about that last week, but I didn't give you an official date. And so June 7th will be that where incoming sixth graders uh, will now be a part of our community. And guys, I want to encourage you to, to, to reach out to any of those that you know, because not meeting in person yet, and we're not sure when that's going to happen, uh, will make it harder to kind of get them in the space and feel comfortable. So, so when they join the Zoom meetings and things like that, um, that becomes highly important. Another thing, guys, I know it's getting old kind of doing Zoom meetings and like screen fatigue is a thing. And we want to be respectful of that. At the same time, you need community. This isn't just about consuming a Bible lesson. As a matter of fact, I've made the Bible lessons shorter the last few weeks, if you haven't noticed, in hopes that it doesn't add to the fatigue that prevents you from joining in with community. So guys, get on the phone, text each other. I know some of the groups are meeting midweek and stuff just to check in on each other and do some fun things. Guys, community is so important. Being the family of God is an incredible blessing. It's where we draw strength, encouragement. We get relationships that show us the character of God, encourage us towards a deeper relationship and faith. And, and I can't stress that it's one of the most important things you can do as a disciple of Christ. As a matter of fact, I would say it's impossible to genuinely be a disciple of Christ without relationships with his family. That's very important. But we are going to look at Matthew today. We're going to be in Matthew 21. There's some things that we've skipped since our verses in chapter 20. Uh, so we ended uh, in chapter 20, verse 16. And we're going to pick up in 21, chapter 21, verse 23. So there's some verses there that what I want to encourage you to do is maybe go back and read that on your own and see what it's showing you that's consistent with what we've seen about who Jesus is throughout the whole book of Matthew that we've been studying. There's some cool things, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the cleansing of the temple where he picks up the tables and all that stuff. So, so there's some cool things, and I want to ask you to think on your own, what is this showing about the character and the nature of Jesus and what his priorities are? But what I want to start in verse 23 for is because we see the chief priests and the elders of the Jewish people come to Jesus and challenge him. It says... And when he had entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders and the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them. I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I, so, I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, oh, we don't know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind, and he went. And he went to the other son, and he said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of, the righteous, in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. So what's going on here? First of all, if you look at the beginning of this, the, they are challenging Jesus because he's challenging the status quo. He's challenging the way things have happened. Remember, I just told you if we read the verses before that, you'd see where he went into the table, the, went into the temple and flipped the tables where the money collectors and changers were having uh, these businesses set up that he was going, look, you've turned my father's business into a den of thieves my father's house into a den of thieves. It wasn't about business. It was about a relationship with God, and they had turned it into a business. And so their whole system had just been challenged, so they come to challenge Jesus. And they come to go, hey, why do you have the authority to do this? Whose authority do you have? We know. 
that as the Son of God, as a second person of the Trinity, God himself, God the Son, Jesus has all authority on heaven and earth. By the end of this book, that's going to be made very, very clear. But he knows their hearts aren't really looking for the right answer. And he knows they're not ready to be honest about what's going on. So he asks them a question, knowing that they have a dichotomous nature, meaning they have two natures, that, they, that, that they're, they're playing two sides. They're trying to play the crowds and their own desires, and they're trying to see what people want to hear and what they should say to keep a good standing and their reputation and how people think about it. And so he says, where did this come? And you see they confer when he says, where did John's baptism come from? They get together and they go, hmm, you know, let's think about the pros and cons. If we say from heaven, um, then they're going to... Say, well, why didn't you believe him then? And if we say from man, then the people aren't going to like us. And we want the people to like us because our whole position rests on them trusting us. So we can't really give an answer here. Just like, then you don't deserve an answer. Mm -hmm. there, there's something really interesting going on in this as they protect their image. I think we can be tempted to do the same thing that chief priests and elders are doing here, though. I don't want us to be aware of this especially in this quarantine time, right? Like like uh, Facebook and social media, even when we weren't in this quarantine time, it had this temptation to present only the sunny dispositions of our life, right? The sunny things that were happening, the, the triumphs. Hey, look, I just got this awesome new shirt. Hey, look, I, I'm winning this award. Hey, look, I'm, I'm going to take this picture 15 times to make sure I look the best before I post it because I don't want you to see what I look like if my double chin is like this, you know, or whatever it is, right? Um, we can all be tempted to think of our image in a way that makes us actually compromise truth. And now in this quarantine time when our only interactions are through video and social media and things like that, there can be an even greater temptation to kind of play this game. And while this isn't the main point of the passage, we see it's what they're doing. And Jesus is going to get to the heart of it in a second. But I want us to understand something. Jesus, when he sees the dichotomous people, when he sees them acting in a two-faced way, that's all dichotomous means, he tells them a parable. And I love when Jesus teaches with parables. And listen, listen to what he says. What do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he said, I go, sir but did not go, which did the will of his father. He asked them this question in the form of a parable. And the answer is obvious. Well, the one who actually did. But see, he said he wasn't going to do it, and then he actually followed through. But there was this other son who said, yeah, I'll do that for you, and he never did it. Well, by posing this question in this way, what is Jesus getting at the heart of? If we are so worried about our image that we become more concerned about what we say than actually how we're living, there's a problem. And this had become the Pharisees, the chief priests, the elders, the ones questioning him and where his authority came from. They were more worried about protecting their image through what they said than the actual lives they lived before their creator as they claim to be godly men seeking God's will. Now we can look at them and we can judge them for this, but, but one of the things that's true in our world is if you're raised in a church culture, or even if you're new to it and come into it, there can be a perception of what people want to hear, and we can learn to play the game. There is a way that as God's people, we can join together in relationship and present to each other what we think we want to hear. We can learn the right answers to sound like a good Christian boy or girl in Sunday school. We can make it sound like we have a deep relationship with God. We can learn some key words and some key verses to pull out at certain times and yet never really spend our days trying to live a life pleasing to God, trying to put into practice the words from those verses, trying to live them out as light amongst those around us who are living in darkness. We just don't live a life honoring to God because sometimes it's easier to play the game. Because I want to encourage you. 
there's no game worth it. Just like Jesus knew the heart of these chief priests and elders, he knows our heart. And we can walk in here and pretend we've read the Bible seven times this week, and we may be even to fool people, but Jesus is never fooled. And the primary point of what we do here is to draw ourselves into deeper relationship with God and his family. But we relate to God's family through him. He becomes the one that connects us. When he is our father and we have an intimate relationship with uh, him, we end up closer to his family. And so if we're lying to his family while he knows the truth, we're actually distancing ourselves from him and then nobody's getting to know us any better in a way that actually could cause real growth in us. Because how can you actually celebrate growth if the growth you're experiencing is something you pretended you experienced months or years ago? That's why I say never be afraid to bring your doubts and your questions and to say I struggle to believe this or I don't understand this. Guys, we have a, we have to realize we have a God who knows where we're at and loves us anyway. And he's not asking us to play a game of image. And he's not asking us to do what we think others want to hear. He's asking us not to say, hey, I'm going to go obey God and then walk away not. He'd rather us say, I'm not going to obey God and then actually do. The words weren't the important part. Not much better, is it? Because the words and the actions are both Clearly, there's your priority on the life you lived. So guys, as you sit in quarantine, as we continue through Matthew, I want to encourage you to live a life seeking God. This isn't just when we gather for youth group. It isn't just when we watch these videos in this current environment. It isn't just when we have Zoom calls. What's the space in between look like? How are you treating your family? How are you honoring God? How are you asking questions of what he's asking of you? Have a great day. I'll see you soon.